Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to a series of videos in which I am reading you a book. We are reading the good book. We are reading the gospel according to St. Luke, my favorite of the gospels, and we're reading it in the King James translation. And we just crossed a hurdle. <laughs> At the end of chapter three is one of those infinite series of begats, and you all got through it like troopers. <laughs> and now we move on to narrative in chapter four. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made of bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou wilt therefore worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on a high pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Again, I want to ask, why is it given to the devil to tempt people? Why is the devil even still alive? Why doesn't God just kill him? Why is all the world given over to him to tempt anyone in it? That, uh, anyway, <laughs> just move on. This is a supernatural struggle in the desert. We've seen this before. Uh, and Jesus returned in power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out of a fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Close quote. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And then he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bore him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is it not Joseph's son? And they said, he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months when great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elias, Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, the city in Sidon, a woman, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, save Naaman the Syrian. There's a lot of explosive subtext that. We'll get that in just a minute here. And all of them in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And rose up, and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereupon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, and came down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his words was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, O holy one of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him, and hurt him not. And they were all amazed, and spoke among themselves, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place in the country round about. 
And he rose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's mother, Simon's wife's mother, was taken with great fever, and they besought her for him, for, besought him for her. Uh, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and ministered unto them. Uh, I want to add a, a quick point here. I won't dwell too far on, the, on the, how many of you uh, presented with the opportunity. Would ask Jesus to overlook fatal illness in your mother-in-law. <laughs> Instead, I will point out that uh, diseases are not sentient. You can't bid them to go. We know what causes them. Far too many people in this country, the country where I am, the most religiously backward country in the world, think that this is true, that a disease is a, is a thing that knows what it's doing. Uh, we'll, that, we'll move on, because the writers of this book certainly did not. I mean, it, Luke the physician or not, the writer of this book certainly did not think that. Uh, now, when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And the devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went to a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him. And he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. And that is chapter 4 of the Gospel according to St. Luke. And there are a couple of things in here that are worth noting. We get the, the temptation, the supernatural temptation in the desert. We've seen that before. That is meant to ground us, the reader, in the fact that this is certainly true. There are no witnesses to that, no human witnesses. And the other acknowledgement of Jesus' divinity, of his actual mission as the Christ, comes not from humans, but also from other supernatural beings. The devil that tempts Jesus in the wilderness is not the only supernatural being that he encounters in this chapter. He also encounters demons, I suppose, of a lesser sort, inhabiting humans. Why would demons do that? No idea. I mean, the, the people who are afflicted with unclean spirits are not running synagogues. They are not tempting souls. They are outcasts. Why would demons bother? Uh, what is the purpose of this, and why is it allowed? And also, the man in this story who was afflicted with an unclean spirit, there's not a word mentioned in Luke that he deserved it. So why do undeserving humans get tormented like this? Why is it allowed? Why, in other words, to ask the age-old question, hasn't God long since killed all the demons? <laughs> but, uh, but they know Jesus, you notice. We've seen this in other Gospels as well. They know him. Uh, humans might not know him or respect him, and of course humans will put him to death, but the, these supernatural beings know him. They know who he is. And he abjures them to be quiet. A little echo of Mark and Matthew. He, he, he warns them to keep their peace on the subject. But the other standout part of this chapter is also a group of people who know Jesus. Right? They aren't supernatural. They're the people of his hometown. He goes to Nazareth to preach. And the crowd is at first overawed. They are, they like what they hear. They like the way he talks. Uh, we don't tantalizingly get any hints of that. We hear that he preaches in, in synagogues and the people are amazed by the power of his words, but we don't get the words. Um, and I think it's pretty obvious from the echoes that bounce all around in the Gospels that we're reading so far that collections of those words did exist. It's easy to imagine an entire book circulating either verbally or Samistat style here in, in first century Judea of the lectures and teachings of Jesus that we just don't have. Uh, the, the people in the crowd are amazed and pleased. They do know him. They ask him us themselves, okay, well, isn't this Joseph's son? Joseph the carpenter? Isn't this, isn't this Joseph's son? Don't we know this guy? Didn't he grow up with us? But that's not the source of their problem. That's not why they turn to wrath. Uh, I've seen in various movie and TV adaptations this particular scene, and it's when Jesus reads from the prophet. The prophet is the prophecy is for the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus tells them, "Today you have heard this prophecy fulfilled." This is another note that the the the, the Luke author will call him Luke strikes perfectly well. We've already seen it, and uh, even in the handful of chapters we've seen so far, the idea of imminence, the idea that this thing that has been so long predicted that it's in old gospels, old lectures is at this moment now happening. Jesus is handed a prophecy that he himself is fulfilling. 
that's not enra what enrages his listeners. His listeners seem to know about him. They seem to know that he has already been working miracles. We don't have much of that in Luke. They must, they must have word of it. And he asked them, well, you're probably expecting that I will do miracles here. Physician, heal thyself. You're probably expecting that I will now start to work miracles in Nazareth. And then he tells them he's not going to. He says there, there were plenty of sick people in the time of Elisha and, and Elijah. And only a couple of them were healed. It's not like they, Elijah was alive at the time. He was a mighty miracle worker, and he didn't heal everyone, including in his own town, we, we can infer. But what does he say about Elisha? But the one person he healed was a Syrian. That's, it's, it's going to lose a little bit of its impact for a modern listener, but that is a, a, not just Jesus saying, yeah, I don't have to heal you. Plenty of examples in, in the gospel, in the scriptures to say that mighty men of God came amongst people and did not heal everyone. So even though you have heard that I go into towns and heal everybody, as we get just a few chapters, just a few lines later, we get him going into town and healing everyone. He won't do that in Nazareth. That's bad enough. But he also brings up the example of the one healing that was done by an earlier mighty miracle worker, and it's for a hated enemy. It's for Syria. Uh, and that throws them into a rage and makes them want to kill him. The people of Nazareth don't just get mad at him. They want to murder him. And he has to, I, I assume, the verse is a little bit uh, ambiguous. I, I have often heard it interpreted that when, when, the, when the, the gospel tells us that he passed amongst them and went his way, that he basically vanished or became intangible, that, that they couldn't lay hands on him. Uh, I don't know about that. I don't have any idea how to interpret that. That would be one of the only times that Jesus does that, if he does. Certainly, even later in this chapter, we see him bedeviled by crowds. He doesn't just vanish. It seems like if he's surrounded on all sides by crowds, he has to beg and plead with them, saying, look, you're not the only town I came here to talk to. If he could just vanish when people are crowding him all around, as you think he'd do it more often. But we get a lot of things in this chapter. Jesus is tempted, supernaturally. He has shown the kingdoms of the earth, the wealth of everything. It's a little bit odd to think that Satan, we don't know much about Satan, the character of, of Satan. That character in these books is a little vague. It's a little bit tough to believe that Satan would think that this temptation would work. And if he doesn't think it would work, why does he do it? Is it preordained, like the, like the betrayal of Judas? It's an odd, it's an odd moment. Because Jesus is never going. There's no chance that he's going to give in. It's certainly not a morally instructive moment, because the man who's possessed by an unclean spirit later in the same chapter, we don't get any impression from Luke that that is a punishment for his sins. It's just that in his case, he's not able to resist. He doesn't have the supernatural ability to resist that spirit coming into him. Whereas, presumably, Jesus does. Uh, but we get, we get that. We get... Uh, Two, uh, one group of people, two groups of people that recognize Jesus. One is supernatural, and they are rebuffed, and they are totally under his command. And the other is normal. The other is, is the people that grew up with him, who he refuses to help, and likens to their mortal enemies. So it's a rough start. It's, this chapter shows us more clearly than anything we've seen so far that uh, the same as Luke's John the Baptist, who is calling people a generation of vipers the minute he opens his mouth in public, this Jesus is is not extending an olive branch to everyone. There are going to be hard edges to this to this ministry. That's the first implication that we're seeing here. And now we're well and truly launched. Now all the preparatory stuff is, is over. Jesus will never be tempted by Satan in that way again in this chapter. And he will never have a rebuff like the one he gets from Nazareth again until the end. So now he's he is launched on his public ministry. And we will see where that takes us next time. Uh, so I will wrap this up for now. Uh, and I'll see you then. Thank you, both of you.